I'm Tommaso Poggio and uh, I'm, I'm doing, using this because we are video streaming these classes and also recording them. So, um, let me tell you about why you are here and uh, I want to start this by telling you, even you probably know a bit about it, I want to tell you about the Center for Brains, Minds and Machines and, and then uh, why the summer school. So the center um, was started, started officially September 2013. Um, it's funded by NSF for the next uh, five years and uh, we hope for the next 10 years. Um, we are told it's also going to be the flagship program for now of NSF. Uh, within the Obama Brain Initiative. So let me tell you briefly what the vision uh, for the center is, what we did do in order to realize it, and uh, our, um, the vision of the center is about the problem of intelligence and the belief that it is um, at least my personal belief is that it's not only one of the great problems in science, like uh, you know, the origin of the universe or the nature of matter or the origin of life, but actually that it is the greatest problem of all. If you can solve it, that's a very ambitious goal. Or even if you can make some progress in it, then you can be smarter. You can make machines that help us think better, and you can solve more easily all other great problems. So that's, these are good arguments why this is you know, a very important problem. And it may be the time to try again to make progress on it. Um, one reason to be optimistic is just in the last 15 years there have been a number of systems that are more intelligent than us in narrow domains. Uh, for instance, Watson winning a Jeopardy against human champions. Um, and uh, before that, Deep Blue was winning against Kasparov at chess. Um, the X-47B has uh, landed on an aircraft carrier last year for the first time. It's a drop without a pilot, doing probably the most difficult thing that a human pilot can do. I think there are more um, drone operators in the US Air Force now than pilots. Um, and all of these systems are intelligent, although in quite a narrow sense, in their specialty. Um, other systems uh, that are kind of intelligent, you know, these are things we did in my lab at 15 or 20 years ago, face detection, and now you have it in your in your camera. Everyone did a relatively good job of finding faces. Um, you have systems that um, can drive a car. Um, this is a, an advertisement by Volvo. There's a radar, SPS 60 and also a camera that detects cars and uh, pedestrians. Um, in the lab, this was done about 15, 20 years ago, but now you can buy a car and it does work. Mm. <laughs> Um, so these systems are getting in our life, and it will be a golden age for, you know, apps of this type. Um, more and more, many opportunities to do interesting things, to make money, but, you know, none of these systems, this was, by the way, Mobileye, 
which is one of our industrial partners, the, com the Israeli company making that system for Volvo and for other cars. Um, even th this system can drive a car that uh, is not intelligent in the sense of, um, you know, mimicking a human being, uh, camouflaging for one of us. Um, it cannot really solve, for instance, a Turing test for vision and of understanding the sea, responding, answering questions about the sea. So, what we think is that in order to take systems that are broadly intelligent like we are, um, we need another phase of basic research on the problem in the intelligence, like it was done 50 years ago at the time of artificial intelligence in 62 or something like that. But this time, instead of relying just on computer science, we can rely on the convergence, on the progress that has been happening over the last few decades in computer science, especially machine learning and the cognitive science and neuroscience. And so, um, so what we did in order to um, to realize this vision is to collect a number of people from various institutions from the, all these disciplines: um, neuroscience, like Ed Boyden and Bob De Simone, and Gabriel Kreiman, and. Uh, uh, cognitive scientists like Nancy Kanoischer and uh, Dees Pelkey and uh, computer scientists like uh, Patrick Winston and Simon Ullman and uh, Leslie Valiant. And, uh, um, and so we put together a team. I want to show you also our industrial partners um, because these are some of the big companies active in uh, the technology, in developing technology of intelligence, um, and then some of the small companies, um, actually there were more, but since we started the center, Google has bought two of them, so they are now. <laughs> um, just to make the point that, you know, we, what we are doing is combination I think ideal combination of basic science and important technology, important for uh, commercial applications. It's kind of a uh, great mix. Um, and, uh, and so with this combination of people and partners, um, what we are trying to do in the next 10 years is um, really to make a, a, some progress on this problem of a broadly human-like intelligence, in addition to narrow um, intelligence that is starting to happen. And for doing this, we have, uh, within the centers, uh, five trusts, uh, five directions of research, each one under a trust leader, so, and each one answering one of the questions, or trying to answer, to make progress on one of the questions that you should be able to answer if you say that you understand intelligence, how it develops, how it is implemented, what it means to understand C, what it means to understand others. And uh, you have George Tenenbaum, Trust One, uh, Gabriel Kreiman, Trust Two, um, Shimon Ullman, Trust 3, and Nancy Kanwisha, Trust 4. And uh, the theory trying to unify this, or theoretical tools for unifying all of this, is, um, say, the fifth trust, which I'm leading. Um, now, in a sense, and this is what I think would be interesting for you to keep in mind, there is one... Uh, kind of challenge which is uh, common to all these trusts. And it is to make progress on developing a system that could um, st 
start to uh, to pass a kind of Turing test for vision. So suppose you are giving a scene or a video, and then I can ask a number of questions about it. I can ask what is there, that's object detection, object recognition. I can ask a question about uh, what is this person doing, that's action recognition. I can ask more complicated questions about social interaction. And, uh, and each one of us can up to a question like, uh, imagine what may be happening in that scene. Tell me a little story. And each one of us can answer this question, rightly or wrongly. There is no machine. We don't know how to make a system that can do that. And so um, the overall goal of the, of the center is to make progress on developing a system like this, which could answer this question, could answer them in a way which is consistent with what we know about humans, how they would answer to this question, what happens in their brain when they're looking at the scene like this, and the, the, they have to um, answer those kind of questions. So, um, so it's a pretty um, ambitious goal, and um, I don't think at all we're going to answer all of these uh, problems and solve them, but uh, progress on it, uh, that I expect, and I think that would be quite important and significant, is to develop really um, models, theory, understanding of uh, what happens in the brain when we uh, do pass to this challenge and uh, um, and how, of course, reproduce it, can reproduce this in machines. So, um, we expect a number of outcomes for, from progress in this kind of challenge. Uh, one, for instance, is um, about uh, machine learning. Uh, you can say that the last 20 years, a lot of the systems I showed you at the beginning, like Watson, or the Nobili system, are uh, a, an accomplish accomplishment of supervised learning and the powerful computers. And the paradigm, the current paradigm for supervised learning, which is quite successful in terms of practical applications and also in terms of a mature mathematical theory, the kind of paradigm is then going to infinity. The more data, essentially big data, the more data you have labeled examples, the better. You know, the Mobileye case, they had teams in India labeling images, labeling cars, pedestrians, millions of images. Now, that's not how human children learn. You know, in order to explain what is a car to a child, you don't show the image of a car, this is a car, this is not a car, this is a million times. We don't do that. And, and so I think the challenge is to understand how uh, humans can learn from a relatively small number of supervised examples. So that's kind of a caricature and going to work. And that's the challenge. So that's something that we can expect to understand better, answering the kind of questions that are part of the CBMM chart. Um, now, um, I want to say, repeating what Lisanne and also Bill mentioned, is that what we want to do in order to achieve these goals is to, in a sense, to create a new field of science, uh, a new area, this uh, intersection between computer science, uh, cognitive science, neuroscience. And, uh, and this means creating a community. I mean, science, um, you probably realized it already by now, but so science is very much a, so a social enterprise. It's uh, creating a community, it's creating 
friends and the network of friends um, speaking the same language, being interested in similar things. Um, and summer schools are a great way to do that. Molecular biology was started by Max Delbruck in, with a summer course in Cold Spring Harbor, the FAGI group in 45. And uh, uh, computational neuroscience was started here uh, in Woodsall by uh, the next student of mine, Christoph Koch and Jim Bauer. Uh, so this is why we are here. Um, you know, you the students are uh, the first generation, I hope, of this new field of science. We still need kind of a name, but, uh, you know, it's the study of intelligence. And, uh, um, and this is, uh, in a sense, the first attempt to try to do, again, what artificial intelligence tried 60 years ago to understand, to make progress in understanding and replicating intelligence in machines. So, um, it's a social enterprise that starts with, would be together for, for two weeks. And so, I hope there will be an opportunity to have a lot of interactions and discussions and ideas and, uh, and, and, uh, and fun together. That's part, big part of what it takes to, um, to develop a new language, a new approach um, to this great problem. Now, um, as I showed you, one important component in this convergence of disciplines is machine learning. And so today and tomorrow, and also part of uh, Saturday, will be about machine learning. And uh, uh, so let me tell you what we are going to do. Um, we'll do mainly supervised learning, which is, as I said, the end going to infinite paradigm. So this, this is a caricature of machine learning. Is uh, machine learning is uh, supervised learning is this problem of trying to find an algorithm or a map or a function that learns to predict the correct y from an x. So to predict an output from an input, you can think of these outputs and inputs as vectors. Usually the input x is a high dimensional vector. The output y is often just a binary number. It could be a high dimensional vector too. And you want to do this starting from just a set of examples. Like in the Mobili case, it would be image one, and is it a pedestrian or not? Or, and, and so on. So you have a lot of examples, and you want to find this function that maps the input into the output, and uh, um, we see that this is quite similar to old problems in mathematics of uh, um, function approximations, interpolations, um, with some new requirements, because the key part here is not to be able to find y for x you already know, that's trivial, but is to find y for x x you have not seen before, the new images. Um, and so this is actually one of the things that I'm proud of. Steve Mail is a great mathematician. And um, this was a paper for 13 years ago in the bulletin of the American Mathematical Society that in a, in a sense, um, put machine learning into 
the mainstream of real mathematics as opposed to statistics or or uh, um, and uh, he had at the beginning of this quote that is from a paper of mine which says that learning is one of the key problems of intelligence and, uh, and that's the why we start this course with it. Um, so as I said, the simple caricature of supervised learning is this in which you know the value of a function, in this case x is one dimensional, you know the value of the function at this red values of x, and the problem is to predict, to extrapolate the value of the function at other points. And as you can clearly see, or um, see from this figure, it's somewhat arbitrary how you do that, you know, which kind of function goes through those points. So, so how can you really solve this problem? Um, turns out there are two very related problems in machine learning, in this kind of machine learning, supervised learning. One is generalization, is to extrapolate from the known values of the function to, uh, to parts, uh, to other values of x here, for which you don't know the values of the function. And people that have recently looked and put the foundations of theories um, saying under which conditions this is possible. Uh, several people, some of them are up there, Vladimir Vapnik, Leslie Valiant, and Steve Smale. And quite related to it is this problem that uh, um, uh, the, the same problem of learning, the same problem of interpolating a function among known data points is um, um, one of the problems in, that are called in mathematics ill posed. And um, as we'll hear from Mahadevan, um, an ill posed problem um, occurs when the solution either does not exist or is not unique or it depends in a discontinuous way on the data, on perturbations of the data. Mm -hmm. All things that are true for the learning progress, the, or tend to, especially the stability one. So, um, let's look at impose problems first, especially inverse problems, and then I will, uh, and so this will be the next hour and a half. Okay, and then I will uh, um, tell you about generalization and deposing in the specific problem of learning.